Hello and welcome to Principle of Cognitive Neuroscience Part A. As you may know, the course is divided in three parts. Main models, which are focused on how people imagine the brain works. I'll explain to you where did these models come from and what they bring brought us today in terms of uh, research and, and, and main results that are published. Um, and usually this model of how the brain works are explored along main concepts as that define what is a publishable result nowadays. Um, these two part of course that will be frontal lectures on YouTube will be I come, will come with like practical lecture uh, 14 hours of practical lectures that will be on Zoom live and not recorded uh, where I'll teach you uh, uh, different things as you can see here on the program. Um, most of what I discussed during my course is available in my book Atlas of Human Brain Connection. So you might want to consult that in the library if you want to complete uh, uh, the course with more information and references. Now let's speak about localizationism. The localizationism is a way of thinking about the brain, which is all about location, location, location. Locations are important. And every pieces of the brain are doing a different thing, a little bit like a mosaic of a different uh, brain functions, brain areas and dedicated to different functions. Um, and it is mostly focused on the surface of the brain. Now you can see here a 3D reconstruction of the surface of the brain. And, um, and as you see on the top, you have the dorsal view and um, you may not be uh, so familiar with it. I'm trying to get like a, oops. Uh, that's good. Um, uh, but um, so you see like the occipital lobe is really at the top of the slide and you have the left and the right hemisphere. So left that is on the right and the right that is on the left. In the middle of the brain on this dorsal view, you can see the brain being divided. The two hemispheres have been divided by the main fissure and this main fissure is supposed to separate uh, the uh, somatosensory cortex from the motor cortex. I'm afraid I have no pointers to uh, uh, to show you, but um, uh, I'll let you follow as uh, this slide as I describe it. At the bottom left of the slide, you have a right hemisphere from the medial view, um, and you see this bulge in the middle of the brain is the thalamus, which is usually described as a bully station. In the posterior part, which is on the right part of this medial view, you see like you have this this fissure, this sulcus, like that is dividing the occipital lobe, and this is. Uh, 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 what we uh, call the calcarine fissure, calcarine fissure, and this is where you have all the representation of the vision. And uh, when you look at the frontal view, which is at the bottom middle part of the slice, you can see uh, the frontal ball and the frontal lobe, and uh, people think that most of the advanced conceptual multimodal thinking and creativity is located in this part of the brain. And um, so you see how uh, people might conceive the, um, the brain as a map and a different area of the brain uh, doing different things. So just, this is just a few examples, um, uh, but what you need to uh, really understand here is like uh, as conceiving this this way, thinking that brain areas work in isolation. Now, we have a typical representation of the anatomy of the brain, but it's not always been the case. Uh, because if you start from the 16th century, this is one of the first drawing of uh, the brain uh, from uh, post-mortem dissections. 
you can see that convolution have been way, very well drawn, but you can't really see all the landmark we've been talking about. And I, I think people started like paying attention and accentuating like some specific landmark in your drawing with the work of Thomas Willis in the, in, in the 17th century. Um, uh, who, who started like depicting that in the brain you can find a uh, 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 typical structure that are reproducible across individuals. And, and for the case of Thomas Willis, for example, he described like a, 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 this uh, polygon of Willis, which are like the vein you can see at the bottom of the brain. And this led to the idea that if if we have a similar structure, it's a little bit like the muscle in the brain, uh, as a muscle in the body, you can actually use a similar structure to do similar things. Um, so the idea of following up this work of Thomas Willis was to find a typical landmark inside the brain to make them uh, uh, comparable from one uh, to the other. Um, and uh, uh, one of the main discoveries were like the identification of the lateral fissure or, or sylvian fissure, which is this lateral, you can see at the bottom left in a lateral uh, uh, sulcus, very deep sulcus in the brain. And because it's very deep, we call it a fissure. And it's been uh, identified by Franciscus Silvius, and that's why for a long time it's been called the Sylvian fissure. Um, uh, and this uh, changed uh, uh, recently uh, with a new nomenclature, and now we call it lateral fissure. In the same way, uh, Luigi Rolando identified the Rolando uh, sulcus, uh, which divides the motor cortex from the somatosensory cortex. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, um, uh, um, uh, and, and it was followed by uh, the, uh, the uh, nomenclature of different uh, part of the brain uh, that were like pinpointed. You can see in this drawing on uh, the bottom right where numbers and decayed areas and, and foldings in the brain that should be uh, reproducible from one person to another. Um, then like the evolution in the concept uh, that uh, uh, followed up comparing brains and finding similarities was to find differences. And one of, one of the main comparisons that people could start to do was to uh, look at um, the uh, development of the brain. And you can see here a drawing from Louis-Pierre Gratelier um, of a fetus brain next to uh, a child brain and next to an adult brain. And you see how the brain is uh, becoming bigger and more complex with uh, its maturation. Now, if the brain becomes bigger and more complex with its maturation. Maybe through the development of the brain, some event can change the trajectory of development of the brain and lead to atypical brains that will lead to uh, uh, atypical um, uh, behavior. So there is this story around the same time uh, um, of uh, somebody who explored that. Uh, uh, the brain of what uh, we'll call today a psychopath, I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, Giuseppe Marco Fieschi was considered as a famous anarchist by his contemporaries, but he was probably best known for his criminal activities. It was among the conspirators that attempted on the life of King Louis Philippe of France. In Paris, together with two members of the Société des Droits de l'Homme, he built a machine in Fenol, an unorthodox weapon consisting of 20 gun barrels to be fired simultaneously. 
On uh, July 28, 1835, Fieschi discharged his machine while we Philip was passing from Place de la République to uh, the Bastille. A ball grazed the king's forehead, but he survived miraculously. Eighteen people were killed and maybe were wounded. Fieschi himself was severely injured and tried to escape. He was condemned and executed by guillotine on the 19th of February of 1836. Lore and Gratiolet were asked to perform the post-mortem examination of Fieschi's brain and they observed an advanced dolicocephalic brain where the length is one-fourth longer than the width and the region beyond the sylvian sulcus are larger than the region above it and the convolution through so large enough are less complex and overall less sinuous. This finding confirmed and discredits the phrenological theory at the same time. Um, so essentially what, what is demonstrated here is that you can have a different brain and this different brain will lead you to have a different behavior. And, and the, through this way, people started thinking, well, yeah, so a different shape of the brain might lead you to have, you know, a completely different behavior. And that's, that's where really the phrenological theory started and um, unfortunately uh, uh, people moved on from just a different shape of the brain to exploring this different shape of the brain through looking at the skull because you know the real interest is to assess this information in the living you cannot you know wait for people to die and you know try to uh try to see how the, how the, the brain is and related to the behavior before the death. Um, so, so people really started like running association between the shape of the skull and, and like the shape of the brain and the behavior. And this is probably the first uh, uh, correlation between brain volume and, and, and behavior, although the link between the shape of the skull and the shape of the brain is actually uh, not that straightforward. It's actually not true. Um, it's not because you have a different, uh, different bump onto your skull that you have a different uh, uh, a brain shape or like a bigger brain areas behind this part of your skull. But nevertheless, the idea behind it was to make a straight relationship between the size of a brain area and the performance that you can have. So people started like building these maps and you can see an example here of the uh, phrenological map whereby every little part that are uh, on the skull, you can touch your skull right now. See, you suddenly you get like a little, little bump in your skull, uh, quite discreet, but uh, you can still have, feel that you have it. So, you know, if you find a bump and for example, it matches the uh, uh, um, conscientiousness uh, area, then like the idea was like your brain behind it was bigger in this area and you'd be a very conscientious person. And that's, that's a phrenology. It might sound, you know, it might sound like a, a, a completely nonsense to you, but you know, the, the error is really to think that the brain, this, lead to like a deformation to the surface of the skull. Uh, but the relationship between the brain size area and the behavior is still used today using voxel-based morphometry in the healthy controls and behavior. So, you know, like, um, it's just the way they tested it that was not good, but the theory behind it is correct. Well, I think, you know, really, the first demonstration that 
uh, uh, the, the, the brain is the organ that will support in some of this area part of your personality and who you are is the case of Phineas Gage. Um, and you might have heard about this case I mean, time and uh, I'm sorry I'm getting back to it, but this is really a pillar of our understanding of the function of the brain. Um, uh, Phineas Gage was, um, you know, he was like the, uh, um, um, the, the boss of his team uh, of, uh, um, of uh, um, uh, construction workers. He was a leader, you get like, you get this picture here, he's in the middle with his uh, colleague on the left and on the right. And their job essentially uh, was to uh, carve through the mountain to open up the railroad. They were opening a way to, for the railroad uh, in uh, the USA to uh, link the east to the west of the USA. So um, Phineas Gage was uh, using explosives and uh, was uh, um, uh, destroying the rock over there using explosive rounds. At that time, you know, I was like uh, quite rudimentary. Uh, the way you do, you were doing things is like you were using it at uh, a bar to make a hole inside uh, the, um, you were using a, a bar to um, uh, make a hole inside the rock and put some explosives and then, and then uh, light up the wick and, um, and um, just like uh, 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 run as, as fast as possible. Especially like the way you were putting the explosive, you were putting like some explosive powder on top of it, you were putting some sand and the, you know, keeping the wick inside it. Also, the story said that uh, maybe, uh, um, you know, that day uh, Phineas Gage uh, uh, forgot to put the sand and now he was uh, tamping in uh, the mix. Uh, he was uh, looking uh, aside a little bit, uh, turning his head and, you know, like the bar scratched the inside of the rock um, and, and that produced like, you know, a little um to strike a little bit of fire and then and then the explosion happened and that like propels the uh, uh the bar like a rocket 20 meters further uh, unfortunately the head of uh, phineas gage was in the middle of the way and so the bar literally uh went uh through like under his bone cheek pop at his left high and uh, came out on the top of his head. And so the story says that uh, Phineas Gage fall on the floor and uh, stay unconscious for a couple of minutes and then uh, stood up and uh, holding his, his, his jaw and asking for help for a doctor to help him. Um, and and that's, that's when uh, John Arlo has been uh, uh, taking care of him. Um, and, um, yep, there you go. And uh, so you have a picture of John, John Arlo in the middle. You have a picture of Phineas Gage with the bar. The bar was like three centimeter thick. Uh, so that's quite a big bar. And then you have the postmortem drawing from John Arlo of the uh, passage of the bar through the skull of Phineas Gage. Now, besides the fact that it is absolutely extraordinary that Phineas Gage survived the passage of the bar through his skull, um, um, Arlo like, uh, de describes some very interesting changes in the behavior of Phineas Gage. And this is the original paper he published in 1848. Um, and uh, he started writing like a lot. Really, his focus in this paper was to describe the fantastic uh, survival of uh, this man that had a bar that went through his head. Um, but, and, and like the paper report day by day the evolution of the case. 
And then some point are very interesting because, um, uh, so he arrived and he said he did not wish to see his friend as he shall be at work in a day or two. Uh, he's able to say where he lives, say where his friend lives and the name, it's like um, he's pretty much uh, aware he's not lost in uh, space and time. However, uh, um, you know, a, a few days later, well, one day uh, later, uh, you know, hello, can I notice something's not right? As uh, Phineas Gage apparently did not estimate size or money accurately, which is weird for the leader of his team. I mean, he's responsible for handling, you know, the paying of his, uh, of his co-worker. And, um, you know, it's like not, not correct. But his memory was perfect. So it looked like something was lost inside his brain. Uh, so as an example, he was saying he would not take a thousand dollars for a few pebbles, which he took from an ancient riverbed where he was at work. And that's, uh, you know, that looks like he lost the ability to represent uh, um, Monet accurately. Then he also showed like some uh, some weird behavior such as uh uh you know like it it was really cold outside the atmosphere was cold and damp the ground wet and he went out without an overcoat and with very thin boots he got wet and fit uh, wet feet and a chill so he got like a uh, sick but it looks like he didn't use any planning looking you know when you go and out in the morning, just checks the weather, and you're like, oh, maybe I should wear a coat. So, you know, he, he didn't do that, so he kind of lost completely um, um, uh, any planning ability. But Arlo, who published his paper in 1848, did not uh, really focus a lot on to these behavioral uh, uh, manifestations. And as, is, uh, as you say, um, at this date, I shall leave the case at present. So result in a few remark of practical nature net, together with the mental manifestation of the patient are reserved for a future communication. And um, this, uh, this communication took about, um, 20 years to happen. So, you know, Gage left two months after the care of Arlo. And, uh, and so Arlo has been waiting for 20 years for uh, Phineas Gage uh, to pass away to get his skull and uh, publish it together in this paper in 1869. During that time, Phineas Gage has been, you know, he's been doing these uh, uh, pictures um, he became famous for uh, having had this case of bar going through his skull, so people were very interested in seeing him uh, kind of a little bit like a freak show at that time. And then he moved on and became a coach driver. Uh, but, um, you know, something around like uh, 12 years after his accident, he started having like a very severe uh, uh, epilepsy crisis and uh, he died in uh, San Francisco uh, uh, at the age of uh, 37. So that's like, yeah, it's roughly about 12 years after uh, the accident. And so John Allo got his body and, uh, and his head and explored a little bit the anatomy. And, uh, and then wrote this other paper in 1869, where he described in details uh, uh, the, um, the uh, behavioral manifestation of Phineas Gage and the relationship with the location in the brain. Um, and that's what he say, not to give uh, uh, the equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities, propensities seem to have been destroyed. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at time in the grossest profanity, which was not uh, previously his custom. 
manifesting but little difference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when in conflict with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future. Um, and this led to uh, the famous saying, in this regard, his mind was radically changed. So decidedly to that his friend and acquaintance said he was no longer gauge. So the damage to his brain radically changed his personality so that his friend and the people who used to know him say it is not the same person anymore. And this is really important because this is a 19th century. This is the first time that who you are is not a scrap, you know, it's not part of the soul or the religion. It's really ascribed in the brain matter and you can lose it. And that's a fascinating part behind this case. It's like you damage something in the brain that led you to lose your identity, uh, the way people <clears throat> see you. Now that the 19th century, but like uh, in the 20th century, this case has been revisited in a famous paper in science published by Damasio, where um, they revisited this case and <coughs> did like a a digital convention of the brain and demonstrated that it might have been a damage of uh, the bilateral or medial frontal cortex. I, you know, I'm not so convinced I'm going to explain to you why after, um, but um, uh, this paper related really uh, the abstract representation of uh, values with uh, location in the medial frontal cortex of the brain. Um, and it took like a few years before, you know, uh, uh, Peter Ratu was able to put his hand onto this skull again uh, in 2004 and really do a very, very fine job of um, uh, scanning this skull and aligning it with the brain to really understand what happened. And that's uh, 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 during the accident. And that's uh, the matter really of the video I'm going to show you right after, uh, where you're going to see uh, the work of uh, Peter Ratu and the digitalization of uh, the skull of Phineas Gage. So the video starts like this. You can see uh, a top view, coronal view and sagittal view. And then from that, because you have a lot of slides, you can reconstruct a 3D representation of it uh, that you can see here. And the next video will be about like the reconstitution of the accident. And you can see right here, this is what happened uh, that the passage of the bars through the skull of Phineas Gage. And so what's fascinating here is that the way you see it, there is no way the two frontal lobe has been damaged. You see, it's a unilateral damage on the bar went through, uh, 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 the bone shake, pop up the eye, came out around the midline, but still in the left part, and uh, damage the uh, left uh, frontal lobe. Um, what's interesting is that people always uh, got a lot of interest about like the damage that had been caused by the passage of the bar uh, when it enters the brain. They rarely speak about like the damage when it, like the area of the cortex where it came out, which is more the dorsolateral cortex. Uh, uh, but we'll uh, speak a little more about this later. What is to remember here is Phineas Gage was a case that led people to associate uh, really um, as a um, medial frontal cortex with uh, 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 the representation of abstract values. And so you get a brain areas in the brain that is dedicated to that. Oops. All right. The next case is the case of uh, Le Boigne. 
so uh, Louis Victor Le Boyn is born in 1801. He's a, he's a very young uh, French fellow, and um, and uh, uh, he lost his mother at the age of three. He's been uh, raised by his father and his two sisters, but somehow he never left the family home due uh, to frequent epilepsy crisis. So he never been able to become really independent. He somehow managed to get a job as a shoemaker, but he lost the ability of speech at the age of 30 following a very severe epilepsy crisis. And uh, he got uh, quickly hospitalized at Bisset, um, where he, made, he met uh, the anatomist and uh, famous French psychiatrist, François Leray. Um, unfortunately, uh, 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 his, uh, his father passed away during his hospitalization, got a car accident, a coach accident when, uh, when he got out. And uh, uh, as, as Louis Victor Le Bon was not able to speak and he was not married, uh, he could not be released to be cared for uh, by close relatives and spent the rest of his life in the uh, uh, Hospital of Bicetre. Like a uh, serious bad luck. Um, though you may think, okay, all well, right, he's at the hospital, at least people are taking care of him. Uh, but the uh, hospital in the 19th century is not what you think, really. Uh, the hospital was uh, a mix between um, care of people with psychiatric disorders and kind of a jail where people were tortured to admit their crime. Uh, you need to know that uh, at that time, people were not using soap at all. So it was like a, also a place where you could get like a serious infection and die, which unfortunately uh, happened to uh, uh, Le Boyne about 20 years later. So he got um, an infection of the leg and uh, and he was uh, 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 supposed to uh, uh, meet Paul Broca for uh, the um, surgery of his leg. So he was supposed to severe his leg because of the gangrene and uh, try to uh, save his life. Um, Paul Broca did the job, but got very interested about the inability to speak of this patient. And um, particularly because recently during the uh, neurological meetings, Ernest uh, Aubutin presented like a, 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 a patient who tried to shut himself in the head, open it like the skull on the left. And when, when Aubutin was like putting a spatula, the, the patient was alive when he was putting like a spatula pressure onto as uh, the inferior part of the left frontal lobe, the uh, patient was not able to uh, speak anymore. And uh, so like really at this period of time, people were feeling this is the right, like that somebody's gonna identify a brain area which is dedicated to speech. Uh, so Paul Broca just uh, patiently wait for the death of uh, his patient. Le Boyne after the surgery, which took like about a few days. And, um, and then like extracted the brain and went to present it to the Société d'Anthropologie de Paris, uh, where he showed that the patient that lost the ability to speak had a lesion in the posterior part of the inferior part of the brain, of the inferior frontal uh, lobe of the brain. Uh, leading him to call this uh, brain region the Broca area and um, kind of uh, uh, discover this result before his competitor, Ernesto Bertin. Uh, Paul Broca publishes in, in his own journal, which he was editor in chief, and that's how uh, he coined his name for this brain area. Other people have been working on to, uh, the labelization of function in uh, specific brain regions. Um, so, you know, we spoke about Paul Broca. He, he carried on dedicating his life to uh, uh, um, uh, really identifying other patients with a, 
loss of the ability of speech. You get another uh, case here, which is a case of Le Long, who also lost the ability to speak, and you can see a very small lesion here in the posterior part of the frontal lobe. Um, and, and this going on with a, a researcher from uh, Germany and France, such as Carl Van Ike or Julius Joseph Deschering, to identify different brain areas, which you have the first map here, uh, where you have uh, three, well, we're gonna start with like the number. So one is the exner area, which is the area which is dedicated to writing. Two is a broker area, that's the area for the uh, elaboration of speech. Three is uh, uh, the somato, well, the motor and somatosensory cortex, whoops, dedicated to uh, uh, the movement of uh, the lower part of uh, the body. Uh, four will be the upper part of the body, the sense, somatosensory information and movement of the uh, upper part of the body, and five will be really the face. Then you have uh, uh, extra areas, uh, such as uh, area number six, which will be an area uh, which will be uh, dedicated to um, uh, reading with the area number seven, and the area number one eight will be for semantic understanding the meaning of things. And this goes on and uh, uh, people uh, started making a relationship between the post-mortem brains and differences in uh, the shape and trying to make a link with function. Uh, so you have a, uh, for example, here is the outstanding brain of criminal and geniuses. In 1882, Edward Charles Spitzka, a young American neurologist, testified as an expert witness as a trial of Charles G. Guiteau, the assassin of the American president, James A. Garfield. Spitzka was asked to examine the prisoner to formulate his judgment on the mental state of Guiteau. Spitzka gave a vigorous and passionate testimony of the insanity of Guiteau, who nevertheless was convicted and hanged. Despite the presence of pathological signs indicative of syphilis at the autopsy, the opinion of the public and the expert converged toward a diagnosis of hereditary insanity and the sentence to death was deemed as unjust. In 1901, the American President William McKinley was assassinated by the anarchic Leon F. Uh, Xolt Gauls. Xolt Gauls was condemned to death and electrocuted, and Spitzky's son was asked this time to conduct the autopsy on Xolt Gauls. Unlike for Guito, the autopsy revealed no abnormality of structure and insanity was ruled out. Edward Anthony Spiska continued publishing a long series of papers containing detailed drawings of the brain of distinguished men of philosophy, art, and science. Among them, René Descartes, Carl Friedrich Gauss, William Osler, and Hermann Helmholtz. Spitzka became the editor of three American editions of the Grey's Anatomy and the director of the Daniel Bose Institute of Anatomy. His work revitalized and popularized in the United States the anatomical approach to outstanding minds whose brains were studied to understand deviation from the norm. So you see how, you know, different shape of the brain in some specific areas uh, were to be related with really uh, 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 specific functions. Um, in the part A of the slide over here, you have the asymmetry between the left and the right hemisphere and in red, you have the uh, temporal planum, which is supposed to be dedicated to language. And you can see that on the left, it's much bigger than on the right, suggesting that the function of language is uh, located in this region because it's very asymmetrical. In B, you have the brain of Albert Einstein. And we can see that uh, uh, compared, and this is what was discussed, compared to, uh, um, uh, uh, normal brains or non-genius brain, 
Albert Einstein, uh, uh, Sylvian Fischer was like pushed throughout the front because he had such a big parietal lobe, which was suggested to be related to uh, his really his fantastic ability of uh, using abstraction to resolve problem of uh, uh, physics and, and, and the universe, the way he did it. Now, localization took like another step with uh, the works that was uh, performed in animals, and particularly in, uh, in dogs. Those poor dogs were uh, explored in terms of function using different approach, such as pressure on the brain, agitation, injection of saline water in the brain, works created at 50 degrees, chromic acid or zinc, uh, uh, really injected into uh, the brain. This is really when, uh, um, when this uh, uh, German scientist started using uh, um, electrical stimulation that, that they started having like very strong, high success in the electrical stimulation of the brain and, and, and uh, behavioral manifestations. Unfortunately, in the 19th century, the use of electricity on the brain and on bodies was not so popular. And this is, uh, this is you know, maybe, uh, you know, at this time, electricity was a very new energy, uh, knowing that Volta invented the first battery of the modern world at the beginning of the same century. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the successful novel of Maya Shelley made electricity something mystical and dangerous. Um, so this really led uh, uh, the, the university of this researcher, which at the time was Itzig and Fritsch, to forbid any use of electricity on, on living and, and dead bodies. Like it, it was considered as something dangerous that people shouldn't do it. And, um, and those two researchers actually carried on their experiment, but they brought the experiment at home, which is absolutely forbidden, but they, uh, they'd been doing hidden uh, stimulation of uh, particularly the frontal lobe in the living dog and, and observe a coordinate muscular act in the opposite side, opening a new area of understanding brain function, which will be using electrical stimulation of the brain to map specific uh, function, to explore the function of the brain. David Ferrier, uh, influenced by his uh, uh, mentor journaling, Jackson decided to extend the work of uh, Itzig and uh, Fritsch further and, and through electrical stimulation in dogs, he identified and described a precise localization of primary cortis that so you have uh, an example here. Um, quickly, his funding were increased and he could test electrical uh, stimulation in monkeys, which is like has a brain that is much closer to the human brain. And he was also the first physiologic to make an audacious transposition of cortical maps that he obtained in monkeys to the human brain. By using these maps, people like uh, William Maxwin and uh, Rickman Goodley feel confident enough to remove for the first time a brain tumor for from a human patient because they knew they would not damage you know, those important maps uh, uh, of uh, motricity and, and, and sensory cortex. And that's, that's really how electrical stimulation went into the field of neurosurgery. Um, but still, we're still really unsure whether human and monkeys will respond the same way to electrical stimulation. In the early 1900s, um, uh, Schlaschenken began to use a monopolar stimulation in order to elicit motor response. This technique allowed Schenkton to determine the precentral sulcus, the parallel area, is the motor cortex, and the postcentral gyrus is a, 
uh, sensory cortex. One of these uh, former student, Harvey Cushing, oops, sorry, um, uh, showed that the central or rolantic fissure is a point of separation between the motor and sensory cortices. But most importantly, he was the first to develop local anesthesia, allowing him to reduce direct to use direct electrical stimulation during neurosurgery to optimize neurosurgery by mapping the in vivo primary motor and sensory cortices. So he was really, really the first to be able to really stimulate with electricity uh, uh, the human brain to map the living human brain and avoid to remove like determinant area from, uh, 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 from the brain during surgery. That was really the beginning of what we call perioperative uh, stimulation, perioperative electrical stimulation uh, uh, during neurosurgery. And this started in the United States. Um, similarly, on the old continent, during the First World War, Forrester, a neurosurgeon who studied with Wernicke and later with Dejerin, Pierre-Marie and Barrett Bensky, audaciously stimulated the motor cortex on soldier with severe wound on the head and observed the motor re reaction on the opposite leg. This was the beginning of uh, stimulation in uh, the old world, so mostly Europe. And, uh, uh, but big, you know, in Europe, it didn't, didn't work so well. He quickly uh, joined Wider Penfield, uh, which was also a student of Sharrington, to, and together, uh, they, so he joined him in the USA, and together they wrote the procedure for brain stimulation in the 1930s. And so that's, uh, that's why the pain field. This approach, when applied to brain surgery, provided the advantage to reduce the amount of critical functional brain area removed, minimizing the definitive postoperative neurological deficit. A true success in the way we could remove a uh, brain tumor from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the brain of patient, optimizing their lifetime and minimizing the impact on their uh, behavior and quality of life. Um, so, and by doing so together, they've been studying a lot of patients with brain tumor and they've been stimulating, they brought, they draw for the first time like the functional field in the human brain of like motor and sensory cortices and uh, they uh, draw the first homunculus, which you can see here. And so if you've never seen uh, an homunculus before, it is a human body which is deformed according to how much space those different parts of the body take uh, in the brain. So you see, for example, um, uh, uh, the tongue and the hand, and this is uh, for the motor cortex, are really big because you have a lot of uh, uh, um, motor ability there. So, and, and like really well, the potential been like, a, it's been a great man in the localization of brain function. He's been able to also induce speech RS by stimulating uh, uh, the broker area. He also been able to elicit vivid memories in stimulated patients, producing, uh, uh, producing these like, you know, travels through time and memories in patients. And then um, and, and you can see here in his, uh, in his drawing, uh, uh, these uh, fascinating areas that he's been uh, depicting, ideation, speech, interpretative, of course, motor and sensory, but you also have the uh, visual sense. And that's, that's really a step forward in the localization of uh, brain function. And uh, this, uh, this method be, became like a, a classic in the USA. And Arthur Ward, for example, after his training in neurosurgery with Wider Penfield at the Moyer Neurological Institute, introduced his practice uh, at the University of Washington. And that led the next generation of neurosurgeons to uh, investigate 
really uh, uh, the brain using uh, stimulation. Uh, but they really focus on a lot on easily measurable and observable tests such as motricity and uh, sensory things um, um, and also like language. But they, you know, did, for example, they completely neglected the right hemisphere um, because it was considered as a minor hemisphere because it doesn't speak to defend in, himself really. Uh, but we now know that the right hemisphere is very important for other things. Um, and, and this concept uh, of like doing surgery of the brain, this confidence that people started developing into doing surgery of the brain led to uh, uh, a neurosurgeon called William B. Scoville to do this dramatical mistake uh, with Henri Molaison, which we see this uh, picture, removing a part of the brain that is essential for the recording of new episodic and uh, new episodic memories. Um, so, Henri Molaison was born in uh, 1926 and he had a lot of epilepsy crisis with a loss of consciousness. And so, because really like uh, pharmacological treatment didn't work out for him, he met with William uh, Bishop Scoville to um, to decide together that uh, a surgery of uh, the brain areas that were leading him to have epilepsy crisis was the best option. Um, William Bishop Scoville at that time had already been performing more than 200 surgeries, he knows very well his experimental procedure, um, and also electro you know, electrical recording didn't really allow him to localize uh, the epileptic focus, um, the areas that lead to the epilepsy crisis in Gustave Molaison. He still decided to do the surgery, being sure that it will be in the medial temporal lobe. He really wanted to make a proof of concept there, showing that surgery can add past pharmacology and decided to remove not only one side for the uh, uh, medial temporal lobe, but like the two sides of the brain to really demonstrate his point. Um, so at that time, like uh, the <clears throat> method for surgery was a little more rudimentary than, uh, uh, than today. Um, so he did like two opening on the front lobe over here, like round opening. And then she's put a spatula inside the opening to lift up the frontal pole. And then using a little tube, uh, he was like sucking, you know, like the, uh, the medial part of the temporal lobe, not knowing how far he's going really. And, uh, and so he removed like the anchors, the temporal horn, uh, the hippocampal gyrus. <coughs> and uh, approximately he removed like eight to uh, nine centimeters of uh, the medial temporal lobe. So still a you know, good part of the brain. And uh, so he close up and the patient wake up, he's fine, he's able to walk, he's able to feel, um, you know, he's able to speak and count and everything. A real success, except that something fundamental changed in uh, uh, Henri Gustave Molaison. And you'll see in the recording just after uh, uh, what happened. Do you know what you did yesterday? No, I don't. How about this morning? That, I don't know myself. I can't tell you because I don't remember. So as you see, uh, somehow the damage to his brain area led Orimolism to not be able to build any new episodic memory. And, and, and this ability was completely lost. So somehow he's been you know all along his life he's been living uh this permanent present tense not being able to remember what happened 
before his surgery and uh, we're now able to happen the day uh, before the day. Uh, and, and he lost completely his ability to elaborate these new memories and he's been traveling through time as if every day were exactly the same day because he couldn't remember the day before. Um, and so that's how we started thinking that in his case, because the surgery damaged the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus, those are the areas where memory are stored. Um, or like, you know, essential for storing new memories, uh, we should say. Then like the story of localization followed up with uh, George Oshman, who was a very famous uh, neurosurgeon who uh, uh, mapped not only uh, language function, but also uh, memories. He also been able to uh, point out that there are some viability across patients in the areas that are responsive for, uh, uh, for language. So it really showed that uh, uh, language localization is not always the same in every patient. And so you really need to use perioperative uh, electrical stimulation. And this has been uh, followed and developed even more by Mitch Berger, who is still a very active uh, no, surgeon nowadays that, uh, that I know is very nice and is really, really an expert into studying language and mapping it in neurosurgery on the surface of the brain. And finally, Hugues Dufault now extended uh, the uh, stimulation to the white matter, a lighting function as network based. So that was not anymore about the localization of function. And we're trying, starting like to move to a different concept here. Uh, uh, and of but by extending the surgery to the subcortical area, it's been able to offer a better functional outcome in patients. He also explored like a lot of other functions such as uh, um, spatial awareness uh, in the right hemisphere and a lot of uh, other things that you can find in his book, uh, Brain Mapping from Neural Basis of Cognition to Surgical Application. Now you, you know, you also have uh, people that have been <coughs> doing not stimulation, but direct recording in the brain during surgery. So they, they, they put an electrode and they, they record really a brain area, uh, well, a very small area of the brain, like a few neurons. And they're able to show that some neurons are very responsive to very precise uh, stimuli. stimuli. Um, so that's uh, in this Curogate uh, Nature 2005, you'll find um, uh, these papers that report that somewhere in the brain of one patient, there is a neuron that only responds to the picture of Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston only, not Jennifer Aniston lookalike, not other star or other friend star, just Jennifer Aniston. And, um, and this is a strong argument in favor that <clears throat> every representation of the world, every function has its little corner in the brain and that the brain is really a mosaic of brain region dedicated to specific functions. <clears throat> This theory has been like a really further alimented by the use of neuroimaging, uh, uh, particularly uh, with the advent of uh, uh, positron emission tomography, where you use like uh, uh, radioactive uh, traces, usually sugar, that you inject to people and like uh, get into the brain, the brain areas that use uh, more uh, sugar, because they work harder, uh, tends to have more sugar around. And then when you put people in the machine and you throw electron onto the brain, it, you know, nobody gets hurt. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Uh, the electron's gonna uh, touch 
this radioactive tracer and uh, when the electron touch the radioactive tracer it uh, send two photons that are captured around the head of the here and this allow you to reconstruct an image that showed you how that shows you how much uh, sugar has been uh, consumed inside the brain during a specific task um, and, and by doing so, uh, um, people have been able to investigate different functions. So you have here the Professor Corbetta, who is now in Padova, uh, who is being able to map directly in the brain the consumption of sugar using PET. And it should, for example, the brain areas that consume more sugar during the shift of special attention when you know you go from the right to the left and left to the right in terms of where you pay attention um, how you can do a conjunction between color and motion or, or what are the specific areas that will be activated during uh, the perception of color and what are the specific areas that will be activated uh, during the perception of motion and did you see how you have like typical little spots that light up? Uh, those are the areas that are supposed to do the function. And this is, uh, you know, really a, a localization of typical areas dedicated to specific functions. This was good, but like the requirement to inject <coughs> radioactive isotope inside the, uh, in, inside the body of people uh, was a little impractical. Mm. So you had to wait for Nigawa to invent um, fMRI. Um, um, fMRI is an absolutely fascinating um, um, way to explore the same thing, a little bit the same thing as PET. And the idea is like uh, you got a stimulus. Um, for example, you know, I show you an image. Uh, it's like it's going to lead to a neuronal activity, um, to, which is either excitatory or inhibitory. Um, and in order to have this activity, you need a neurovascular coupling. You need more blood that comes uh, that uh, increase the blood, blood flow in order to provide oxygen to your neuron. And, and this blood flow uh, and this increase of oxygena oxygenation is detectable by the MRI scan uh, that will able, be able to uh, uh, give you uh, a bold, um, what we call a uh, blood oxygen level dependent response, okay? And, uh, and, and this is what you see essentially uh, when you uh, look at fMRI. And fMRI has been applied to tons of functions and you, you can see like those beautiful papers such as uh, Pesiglion in Nature 2016 uh, that have been demonstrating uh, the brain areas that are related to reward or punishment um, uh, through a manipulation of gain and loss in a gamble game and you can see how you can really see where it happened in the brain uh, or analogical thinking, whereby uh, we can see that not only brain activations, but also brain lesion in the same area can either uh, uh, lead to, um, so when you use a task of analogical thinking, patient will activate this brain area, which when it is damaged, leads the patient not to be able to uh, uh, perform uh, this task of analogical thinking anymore. Um, and you have examples as well of uh, other areas being dedicated to reading. So like you have this work from uh, Cohen in the 2000s where you contrast uh, uh, like a, a text with scramble text, text if I remember well and you have uh, uh, five different patients here where you can see that systematically uh, the ventral part of the temporal lobe is activated during uh, the reading task and, and when, when you take patients that have 
uh, damage into the brain, um, either not in this area or in this area, you can see that they have uh, also uh, a different pattern of activation and difficulty to read. And um, you can use the same investigation and approach to explore many other functions, uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, numbers representation and numbers manipulation through multiplication and division, um, uh, whether this is hard or not hard, or for the letters, letter substitution, um, you know, and then you can do contrast between all these tasks and start building your map of the brain. Uh, to some extent, uh, you can you you can start recording the brain of people and eventually if you scan them for long enough or if you have a an experimental task that is smart enough you might be able to map the entire brain and uh, this is what has been done by uh, uh, the work of Toshidov that has been published in Nature uh, a few years ago I think it's um, four years ago where they map uh, the entire uh, brain semantic. Like, so every word had its little place in the brain and they did this full map of the cortical surface and what is doing what. Is doing what. And I, I'm showing you now uh, the video of uh, this map, the making of this map. This is a map of someone's brain, showing roughly which areas respond when they hear different words. For example, there's a small area in the middle frontal gyrus that reliably responds to hearing the word top. But it's not just one word, one location. A single word can activate a whole range of different brain regions. So we find the word top in a bit of brain that seems to respond to words associated with clothing and appearances. But also here with numbers and measurements. And here with buildings and places. We usually think of language as being restricted to certain sections, like the temporal lobe. So researchers were surprised to find activity all across the brain and in both hemispheres. The map was made by scientists at the University of California, Berkeley. They put volunteers in an MRI scanner and had them listen to stories for two She's hours. back in the front again, deep, deep, and she pulls out a pack of matches that have been laundered at least once. By monitoring blood flow to different parts of the brain, they worked out which places were responding to the meaning of the words, the semantics. They found that different bits of the brain responded to different kinds of words and concepts. And they could group them into rough categories, shown here by the different colours. Dark green bits, for example, were most activated by words to do with numbers, red bits by social words. Here, in the right temporoparietal junction, this speck of brain, just a few millimetres across, was found to respond to words like wife, mother, pregnant and family. And this bit, just next door, responds to some of the same social words, like family and wife, but also words to do with places and people, like house and owner. Generally, the concepts represented in each brain region relate to other functions that scientists already know about. So words to do with how things look, such as stripes, are likely to be found near the visual cortex. And although each individual's map is different, Looking at these three brains, it's clear that different people have the same kinds of concepts in the same kinds of places. This is the first time we've been able to map the semantic systems of the brain in such detail, discovering that words are grouped by meaning and revealing just how complicated and widespread the word maps in our heads really are. And the brain map is available online for anyone to explore.
All right, fascinating, isn't it? Um, and though this is like, you know, just one task of semantic and how you map the entire semantic in the brain, you think that everything takes its place and really the brain looks like a mosaic of different function. Um, if you want to explore more about this mosaic of brain function, you should go on the website of neurosynth.org, whereby all the works that have been done in fMRI for the past 20 years has been summarized as meta-analytic maps. Uh, it's entirely free. You can check and look for any function there and find specific pattern of activations and download the maps and look at it and do analysis on that if you, if you want to. This map is, is, you know, and it's absolutely fascinating. I've been spending hours on this and then you can find the study. Um, um, but the things that I want to lead you to understand and, and, and start thinking about for the next lecture is you don't have a single area per function. You have a group of area. And here, for example, you can see working memory. Uh, we, we don't see it all over here, of course, but you already see, see on the coronal section on the left that you have uh, three separate brain regions that are co-activated during this function. And you also have some parietal one, but let's just focus on that. And, you know, it, to me, it doesn't look like a single area is equal to one function. It looks like a pattern of brain activation is leading you to have a function. So that's pretty much, you know, something that's been bugging me during my postdoc years ago, which was like, for example, you take this very famous model of uh, the functioning of attention. You have in blue the control, goal-directed attention that is essential when you strategically orient your attention toward visual, visual targets. It's like uh, when you're in this pub and you're looking for this friend, uh, you're gonna try to explore and look for him. And you have the grab stimulus driven attention, which is the unexpected and automatic orienting of attention toward visual targets, it's like something sudden happen. Uh, uh, you know, you're probably sitting at home and watching this lecture and a clown's going to come in the room and you suddenly capture it. Like, what is that? And um, uh, so those rely on uh, different uh, brain system and areas, which is a dorsal frontal parietal network that you can see here, frontal parietal, intraparietal sulcus and superior parietal lobule for the control goal-directed attention. And for the ventral one, you get the ventral frontal cortex with the temporal parietal junction that are activated. Um, and this is, is this, again, this, you know, you may say, okay, great, we have uh, uh, different brain regions that are uh, uh, doing different things. Uh, but I'd like to stress that the brain is not wireless and how if those regions are working together, how does, you know, how do they communicate? How does it work? Um, and is there an order in the way they exchange their information? Is this bilateral? How do, you know, how do they interact really? And that, that's where, that's where really the localizationist approach becomes limited. It doesn't allow you within this framework of thinking of the brain to explain really how uh, the, the brain can uh, uh, use those different regions together to elaborate the function. Another big, uh, big issue is like, uh, so if you take like many different functions and you look at the brain areas that are co-activated, uh, um, although they are different functions, so you get physiospatial saccade, mental imagery, voluntary oriented attention, automatically capture attention, 
verbal working memory, spatial working memory, phonological processing, semantic processing in language, motor sequence, inhibition, number manipulation, emotion, decision making, and mirror neurons. Although, yeah, very different function. But as you can see, some areas are always activated by these functions. And that will mean they do it all. Or do they do something essential to all these functions, but we don't have a word for it? Or are they just an obligatory passage into the network of functioning of the brain? Um, all this, all these empirical findings demonstrate that matching a one-to-one -one function to brain areas, um, although it is a good first step, is a limited vision of the functioning of the brain. And I will try to assess a different vision in the next, next course, which will be about as a model of associationism that show you how brain vision can be uh, uh, associated, associated together uh, to produce a function. I'll take this opportunity to uh, invite you uh, to join us for the special issue uh, symposium in the 11 and 13, that'll be available on YouTube, um, where you will see a quick update about the structural connectivity of uh, the brain. And uh, every Monday morning, please come and join us uh, for the Neurochino between 9.30 and 10.30 in the morning where we'll discuss what happened last week in science and why is it so exciting. Um, I will add to that that uh, uh, the grading of uh, this uh, uh, master module is based on uh, that, uh, your attendance to the practical lecture, your participation to those practical lecture, but also the way you will ask questions uh, on the uh, Neurostar uh, forum so that I can, you know, reply to your question. And I know that you, you've been thinking a little bit about uh, uh, teaching and the uh, concept that we're discussing here. And I'll ask you also to do a little project, uh, which is uh, writing an essay on a uh, brain hierarchy of your choice. We'll have the lecture on brain hierarchy so soon. Um, I want you to choose one brain hierarchy and write an entire essay uh, um, um, about it uh, with a total of uh, 1,500 to 2,500 words. Uh, this number of words does not include uh, the reference at the end of your essay. And your essay need to be uh, divided in uh, five parts uh, one uh, general introduction when I want you to get me excited about a uh, brain hierarchy and the hierarchies that you chose. Um, the way you can do that, you can think if, uh, if you speak to non brain expert and they get interested about what you're saying, that means you're doing a good introduction. Then you have another section that has to be about the anatomy of this hierarchy, where it is in the brain. Um, then I want a little section where you discuss whether this hierarchy is lateralized and if uh, there is no reference demonstrating its lateralization, uh, you can dedicate this section to explaining how would you investigate the lateralization of this brain hierarchy. Um, another section uh, uh, of this essay uh, need to be related to the link between this brain hierarchy and brain evolution. We'll have also a lecture on brain evolution, so uh, don't worry about that. <clears throat> and the final part is a synthesis. A synthesis is not repeating what you said before, it's showing how those uh, three sections, anatomy, lateralization, and brain evolution work together to be more than the sum of those three parts. Okay, bring it up, open it up for future research, make it interesting. It's really important you learn to write well and write in a way that is captivating for the people reading your work. Thank you very much for your attention. 
And I look forward for your question, whether you post it on this YouTube channel or if you put it on the uh, uh, Neurostar forum. Thank you very much and see you soon.